Hello and welcome to round number three of the European Team Chess Championship 2017. Coming to you live and direct from Hersonisos in Crete, the lovely Crete Amaros Hotel. And today we get lift off because we have some of the big guns facing each other as is usual in Swiss systems. The favorites start facing off against each other. In round number three for one match that I'm looking forward to in particular is the match between Hungary and the Netherlands on board one. We've had a lot of the Dutch guys in yesterday. We've heard from Jorn van Forest, Luke van Veli, their captain, and Anish Giri, their top board. And they are facing Hungary, one of my dark horses for a medal, the ever solid Hungarian squad, with Peter Leko on the top board facing Anish Giri. There's been a lot of talk about Anish being Leiko's predecessor in a way. And I think it's accurate to some extent, not because they both made a lot of draws, but because they're both big researchers in the opening. When I was doing commentary with Peter Leiko during the Bam Bam tournament, he was praising Anish for Anish's approach to the game. So there's some sympathy for each other's styles there. But we'll see if that sympathy extends over to the chessboard. We do have the first moves e4, c5, knight to f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, and knight to f6 has been played. Looks like we will get a knight off, no surprise there. That's Giri's main opening. And Leiko also not avoiding a theoretical discussion. Leiko, of course, could have played 1d4. Or the move 3, bishop b5 check, if he were so inclined. But it looks like he wants to see what Giri has in store in the knight. Leiko decides on the move 6, f3. There are, of course, a million other options. The main point of f3 is that after bishop to e3, knight to g4. What's going on? After bishop to e3, knight to g4 has pretty much been established as a good move. And White, including Peter Lenko himself, has been struggling to get any advantage in these lines. Therefore, people start with f3 a lot in order to reach bishop e3 systems, but without being bothered by knight to g4. Of course, there's a price to pay. You slightly limit your options. You can no longer play with f f4, an early g4, early h3, g4, and so on. But that's what Peter, Peter Lenko chose. e5, knight to b3, bishop to e6. Mm. Bishop to e3, bishop to e7, and queen to d2 has been played. All of this probably fairly well known, even though not very well known to me. Is this the position where they play d5 sometimes? I'm not 100% sure. I have a feeling it might be premature here, but I also vaguely recall some Vichy Anand games that took some course like this, which I'm sure Peter Leiko wouldn't mind an endgame where he's slightly better. And I have a feeling that will not happen. Queen e2, short castles, long castles, knight bd7 is on the board. So we're in for a sharp fight. Maybe both sides are fighting their reputation of being drawish players, even though their reputation never had anything to do with their opening repertoire. They always went for fairly sharp lines. On board two, we have the two blockers, if one can describe them like that. Two of the lower, lowest rated players in their respective lineups, even though in Erwin Lamy's case that's not really accurate, he's 2-6-11, just as Benjamin Bock and Jorgen van Forest is 2 6 9 But the Dutch like putting him on a high board no matter what his rating, because he has a very solid style, doesn't lose much to stronger opponents. And Viktor Erdos serves a similar function for the Hungarian team. Viktor Erdos rated 2624, while his colleagues Rapport and Almashi on boards number 3 and 4 do outrate him significantly, 2686 and 2707. But Viktor Erdos, very much a theoretician and a classical Hungarian school of chess player, very well prepared in the opening, very hard to defeat. So I like their setup that they put Leko and Erdos on board 1 and 2, the two tough guys to beat. And then the goal-getters, Rapport and Almashi on the lower boards. We'll see how the Dutch squad can neutralize it. As you would expect, between Lamy and Erdos, we get a solid opening. The good old Catalan 
and Erdos does not go for the main lines with d takes c4 here, but instead plays the, I don't know what people call this, the close Catalan with knight b7, queen c2, c6, which you rarely see via this move order. I can't claim any expertise here, so I'm sure Erdos knows what he's doing. But typically, if people want to play this type of position, they throw in bishop b4 check, and after bishop d2, they go bishop e7, bishop g2, castles, castles c6, queen c2, knight bd7, because here white doesn't have the option to put a piece on d2, as we've seen in the game, and also to fear and capture this bishop f1. Still, Victor Ardush, I am 100% sure, has his own ideas about this opening. b6, e4, d takes c4 has appeared on the board. And here, to my Patsar understanding, after knight takes c4, bishop b7, White should be a little better, but as I said, he will know what he's doing. And he's probably worked out that you can get some quick counterplay here with b5 and c5 under the right circumstances. On board number three, we have everybody's favorite player, Richard Rapport, facing against Luke van, facing Luke van Veli's favorite player, Benjamin Bock. And Benjamin Bock, big theoretician against Rapport, who's a freestyler, but um, there's been a little bit of a trend in Rapport's games recently to play more main line to play more safely, and maybe it's also because it's a team competition. I mean, we've seen him win some end games in this tournament already, and we haven't seen him do anything overly crazy in the opening. This is no exception. He goes for so tears before you leave. Can I see something on that screen? Uh, by any chance. Uh. Mm. So we've seen Rapper play some solid openings. This time he goes for d4, c4, knight f3, g3, which is as mainstreamy and solid as it gets. And Benji Bok, after bishop g2, plays the move c5. That is thanks, much more aggressive than c6, followed by d5, which they have been playing a lot recently. After c5, black faces a bit of a choice between going for d5 with either a Benoni type situation after e6 or a Benko type of game after b5, c takes ba6. Both of these much sharper than the good old symmetrical positions after c6, d5. So, Benji Bok, maybe his captain, gave him a little speech yesterday. Who's blocking our view there? Is that his very captain? Gave him a little speech yesterday after his not very eventful draw with the white pieces against Ukraine. Said, okay, now you must play sharply with black against Hungary. I'm not sure that would be the correct approach, but certainly c5, more aggressive move than I would have expected. And after d5, e6, Rapport says, you know what, I don't want to play your mainstream Benoni positions with knight c3, e d5, c d5, let's, let's change the structure. Rapport enjoys going for slightly offbeat structures, and he blitzes out the move d takes e6, which you don't see that often here. Leaving black with a choice between f takes e6, intending to play d5, pushing the center, but of course slightly weakening his king's position in the process, or the more solid d takes e6, inviting white to play what to me looks like a pretty equal, almost symmetrical endgame position. We'll see what Benjamin Bock chooses. I would probably play d takes e6, but I've never been called an entertaining chess player. So let's see what Bock is up to. Then there, on board number four, we see Jordan van Forest, who Yesterday told us that he was only expecting to get one game with his tough team captain, but he does play today for the Dutch on board number four against the veteran Zoltan Almashi. Almashi giving him the look there, sizing him up. Do you really know what you're doing here, Van Forest? How dare you play the Scotch against me? I was analyzing the Scotch way before you were born. Um, I'm not sure if that's what Almashi is thinking, but yeah, probably is. Anyway. The Scotch, of course, a much more open opening than the Spanish or the Jacopiano that dominate top-level chess. Almashi also always been a good theoretician. 
goes for the move, knight to f6. In my opinion, the critical line takes e5, queen e7, queen e2, knight t5. All of this is well known. After c4, black faces a choice between my favorite move, the move bishop a6, pinning this pawn, and the move knight to b6, which I believe has been al Nashi's main choice for a while now. After knight b6, white typically goes knight c3, and then black has to decide how he wants to arrange his pieces. There's many moves here. Queen to e6, I've seen a5, I've seen g6, I've seen... Let's see what al Nashi does, and he goes for a5. Intending to put this bishop on a6 in many a line without having this bishop hang in the air. It feels a bit awkward to play bishop a6 without having played a5 after b3. This setup just feels a little funny. So that's one idea of a5. Another one is to just push this a pawn up the board, getting rid of this weakness because it is an isolated pawn. It does make it a little harder for white to get his standard setup with b3, bishop b2. Because here b3 would be extremely well met by a5 to a4. We'll see what Jorn van Forrest does. I believe bishop d2 is what they normally play here. But since I'm firmly team bishop a6 all my life, my knight b6 knowledge is fairly basic. So that is the opening phase in the match between Holland and Hungary. And it looks like Hungary, a nation of natural born opening theoreticians, have succeeded in making their opponents think first because there on camera we see Peter Leko lost in deep thought on board one or on board two till four. It's the Dutch guys staring, I don't know, Jorn van Foray is not exactly staring at the board, staring into thin air while Rapport, Almashi and Erdash are having a little, well, stroll. Players, of course, aren't allowed to talk to each other nowadays. The rules got much stricter than they used to in the old days. The old days aren't that long ago, like let's say 10 years. There was a lot more chatter between players during games, but nowadays with, of course, computers and cell phones being so strong, it is much more enforced that no one talks to each other during a game. We should enforce that no one stands in front of our camera there. We need some regulations, but Viktor Erdos has now made it back on screen while Ivan Salgado there in the background. The Spanish number two, or he's probably Spanish number three, he's number two in this tournament because Paco Vallejo is not playing, is also going for a little walk to check out the action on the top board. So we have seen enough of this match and maybe should move to board number two, where the top seed, Russia, is facing the Czech team. Czech team always a force to be reckoned with in such events have David Navarra on the top board. There we see David Navarra facing Alexander Grishuk. Um, Navarra yesterday crushed Badur Tobaba. Always does well in team competitions. I'm not sure if that's true, but it sounds like a good thing to say. You guys look it up and let me know if he is indeed playing well in team competitions. On board number two, we have Viktor Lasnichka facing Jan Nepomneshi. Lasnichka. Slightly outrated, but still a very solid 2650 Grandmaster against Jan Nepomnesi, who normally has a job to score points for this Russian squad, even though it's no longer like when he was a little younger and he was typically playing on board 5, the reserve board, and was supposed to create havoc on the last board when he was playing. This time around, he's board number 2 against Lasnichka. Let's have a look at how the games are going. Navarro Grishuk, typical Modern line, the, what do you call this stuff? Anti-Berlin, d3, bishop c5, c3, and d5. This is a bit of a recent wrinkle, because people have realized that after knight takes e5, short castles, black is doing quite well here, finishing his development very quickly, and white will probably not enjoy his pawn grabbery. Therefore, after d5, White typically choose between e takes d5, which is met with queen takes d5, or some move like knight bd2, or queen e2, or queen c2. And by starting with d5 and not short castles, you avoid some things. For example, you avoid white playing with an early g5, if that's with an early bishop g5, if that's what scares you. Therefore, Grishuk going for the trendy line, and Navarra plays knight bd2. Grishuk says, all right, let's clarify the situation. Takes, takes, queen e7. I believe there were some games with 
the direct A5 here as well. There was some game. Maxim Vashiela Graf versus Ho Yifan, where after A5. Maxim went on to take this pawn and things got very direct. Grishuk not in the mood for such force life. Defends the E5 pawn first by playing Queen E7. Not too concerned about why pushing B4. And instead, Navarra starts with Queen E2. And now Grishuk plays move A5, stopping White from going B4 and also introducing the idea of playing Knight to A7 in some positions while discouraging white from taking on c6, because here after bishop c6, bc, now once again a5 is very useful, since black is already ready to go bishop a6 and tackle the white queen on e2. So far so good, typical structure, where white tries to create a tiny tiny edge, because the knight on c6 is slightly misplaced due to the pawn on c3, but I'm pretty sure that Grishuk knows what he's doing here. Board number two, Nepomnesi Lasnichka, is one of these sharp Karokan lines, which I'm sure both sides are familiar with. The very main line of this business, this business, 3d5, advanced variation, cd4, knight d4, knight e7. And this is a position where white has tried pretty much every legal move under the sun, knight c3, knight d2, bishop g5, f4, c3, short castles, all of those have been played. And after knight bc6, bishop b5 is a line where white is willing to lose some time in order to inflict black with an inferior pawn structure. That's what happens in the game. a6 takes, takes, c4, queen d7, knight c3, and d takes c4. Knight to a4. I guess all of this is still theory. Knight a4 threatening knight to b6. And Lazinska parries it with knight to f5. Knight takes, e takes f5. Rook to c1. Now, the black structure is a little rotten, but he does have nice pieces. The knight on d5 looks good. The bishop on e7, followed by short castles, also looks good. But is that enough compensation for these weakened pawns that he has? I'm not sure. I would, I would choose white here. I'm not sure how much of an advantage it is. But there are some targets over here. So. My guess is both sides are following their preparation, but I like the white chances. Oh, and he didn't play bishop e7, he went for c3, interesting. Attempting to make this knight capture on c3. And after knight takes c3, you can go knight takes e3 with an equally bad pawn structure for white now. So instead of taking on c3, the pawn she blitzes out queen c2, he shows that he's done his homework here willing to sacrifice a pawn in order to speed up his development. CB2, Queen B2, for example. Knight takes E3, F takes E3. Now white is a pawn down with a rotten structure, but he does lead the game of getting his pieces out quicker than the opponent. Is that a game? Um, and yeah, if Nepomna should check this at home, be very dangerous. Can't go bishop e7 because of knight to b6. Or can you? Or b8. Maybe it's not the end of the story. Yeah, but this is something to keep an eye out for bishop e7. There's also e6 intending to take on g7. So it feels like a dangerous position. I would not be surprised if Lasnichka would start looking for some way to kind of bail out, not grab this pawn, but maybe develop a piece instead. Just play bishop e7 and hope for the best. If he has to start thinking here, that's good news for Nepomnesi, who would have won the theoretical battle. Interesting game on board number two. Zbunek Ratchek on board three, the veteran, faces Nikita Vityugov, yesterday Anish Giri in our show called Yuri Krivorushko, the Ukrainian Vityugov. By that he meant that Krivorushko and Vityugov are both extremely strong players that don't get a lot of exposure, a lot of invitations, aren't household names really. But make no mistake, Nikita Vityugov is one of the best chess players on earth. 2728 is a slightly low rating for him, normally around 2740. And yeah, with more Super Tournament X invitations, I'm sure we would hear much more of Nikita Vityugov. Here, with the black pieces against Ratchek, he's decided to play a classical mainline, keep everything on the board. Rook e8, d4, bishop b7. Very unlikely that Ratchek 
is interested in early move repetitions like this one in a team match. Mm. Indeed, red check. Has played knight bd2, bishop f8, a3, h6, and bishop to c2. Mm -hmm. All of the theory, I think they often go knight b8, knight bd7 here, completing this briar type maneuver. When the black pieces are a little more harmonious, harmoniously placed, and when the knight is just sitting around on c6. Who's sitting around on board number four? It's no, it's not Sagimov Sadian. Sorry, it is Maxim Matlakov, man from St. Petersburg, who's also been a steady climber, the reigning, is he the reigning? I think he's a reigning European individual champion. At age 28, 29, somewhere in that neighborhood, he's been increasing his playing strength step by step, rated 2730 now at a great World Cup as well as we were talking about the other day, where he lost an epic match against Levan Aronian to get eliminated, but came very, very close to kicking out the big guy. Hmm. So, that's that. Of course, Russia, significant favorite here, but on four boards, so many things can go wrong. And we've seen some favorites fall. Amongst others, the Ukrainian men's team losing to Holland, which brought us the match on board one that we see today. Armenia, Levon Aronian, once again, going for the good old Marshall Theory Jungle. This is stuff that I'm quite familiar with. The mainline marshal after queen f3. Aronian chose him with queen h4. I've played all of rook e8, queen f6, and queen h4 in this position. But queen h4 has been Aronian's weapon of choice in order to make a draw against Ivan Saric from Croatia. He sees no reason to deviate from this. All of this well established. White returns the pawn for speedy development and has been trying to make something happen in these endgames after a4, h6. Ironia has normally been defending these positions without a lot of drama. King g2 used to be the main move here, but h4 will not come as a surprise to Levon either, because Maxim Vashilagraf played this move against Levon Aronian himself. So my best guess is that Saric has been instructed not to mess around with Levon too much, play a solid theoretical mainline. If it's a draw, it's a draw. And I would guess a draw it is. Board number two, Voyastevich versus Sergei Movsezian, who lost yesterday to Ristos Banikas. He's been slightly vulnerable for this Armenian squad once in a while. They have defeated Sergei Movsezian when he was representing Armenia, making yeah yesterday's match a bit closer than I'm sure the Armenians would have liked it to be. But in the end, they came through because on board four, Van Elkumian defended his endgame versus Stelios Halkias. So Armenia also has the full amount of points. Mm. What's the position? Ah, some boring, uh, typical Spanishish structure. Yeah, whatever. White is slightly better, I guess. So knight h5. I'll put the knight somewhere. We've only just begun. Gabriel Sargisian, one of my favorite theoreticians guy whose games I always check, is facing Aloysi Jankovic. Nothing to do with the musician El Jankovic, I would guess, but you never know. After c takes d5, knight takes d5, it seems to me that Sagisian is already close to equalizing. Because, yeah, this might be 2 I'm sure it has some ideas, but knight c3 looks a bit more challenging and here after c5, knight d5. Seems like we're gonna exchange all the pawns in the center and get a very equal position very soon. Welcome Jan versus Sasha. Sasha? Sasha? I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Martinovic on the bottom board. Welcome Jan pawn down, but he might be able to grab it. Um, grab it back. Might be eight. Oh. 
Who knows? I don't understand this. Might be 8.30. I'm not saying it's a bad move. I'm just, yeah. Slightly bamboozled that you can play like this with black. But maybe you can put the bishop on d5. It's not really in white's interest to exchange the light square bishops. So knight e5 never really on the agenda. And after bc, bc, queen e2, queen c2, bishop d5. It's not obvious to me if white is better at home. So interesting stuff there by Sasa Martinovic on board number four. Fiona's just come in. Fiona, what's happening out there? What can you tell us? Nothing. Same road, same road. I've just been taking some photos, having a look at more. Uh, I found more costumes. Let me join you for a second. By all means. I haven't really seen what's been uh, going on on the boards, though. Counting. Ooh, same old, same old. Counting on you for, uh, to tell me. Have you looked at the women's section yet? Not yet, but I was just going to go there because we have a big match today between Russia and Ukraine. Did you take some pictures there? I did. The handshakes? Take, no, I wasn't so early today, but no, uh, a big match. Uh, already, I mean, not Oops, decisive. My apologies. Not decisive for the medals, but could be a, how do you say, for Entscheidung? I'm getting my questions in earlier today. Um, I don't know. I'm still very sleepy, which is strange because <laughs> I woke up like, like yeah, 8 a.m. But it's still, sometimes you need to get these vocal cords rolling before you can form any English words. So it could be pre-decisive, is that a word? Sounds like a word. Mm -hmm. pre I guess people will at least understand what I mean. I think if one of those teams um, loses, that's a, a big a big result, is what I'm trying to say. I'm also struggling, apparently. Um, I think both teams are playing with their top four lineups, which was to be expected. Um, it's going to be interesting, for example, Valentina, she lost the first round to the young uh, Greek talent, uh, Stavkula. I, I really need to remember her last name. <laughs> so like you do. How I, hard can it be? How hard can it be? <laughs> um, and then she got benched yesterday. It will be interesting to see how she recovered. She is right today. So just can we go full screen for one second? I need to add the live PGM thing. Give me one All right, here we are. Mm, Sicilian, knight c6, Castanio goes for bishop b5, which nowadays is just as popular as 3d4 here. e6, castles, knight g7, rook e1, a6, bishop f1, all of this well known stuff. d5, also the main move here, when white typically chooses. Between the move d3, which looks humble, but it's quite venomous. And the move e takes d5 that was once played by Magnus Carlsen. And he defeated Boris Gelfand with it after e d5, knight d5, d4. 
What Y is trying to do is exchange the pawn on C5 and then get a 3 versus 2 majority on the queen side. But of course, the price you have to pay for it is that black gets his own majority, 4 versus 3 on the king side. It's not supposed to be a line that gives white anything special. I believe Rajabov also had a couple games here, and it's supposed to come very close to equality. But I'm sure Kostenyuk and the army of Russian coaches have done their homework here, choosing this line. Who are the coaches for the women's team? We talked about the other day. Rublevsky is the team captain. Who else is there? I think Ria Zansev is also working with the women's. And then Motilev and Potkin with the men. I've seen this guy Nayer around as well. Is he working in I some he, function? I think he's the fifth guy I forgot the other day. Because okay. we were talking that the, the Russian uh, coaches, if they were fielding a team in the open section, they would make the top five uh, with a team composed just of their coaches. So... Pretty impressive stuff here. Yeah, Nair is around, but I'm not sure who he's working with. I, I guess they are assigned to one team, or do you think there are people who work for both, maybe? I don't know how it works. Could be slightly flexible, but I have a feeling Nair, I read somewhere, that he's also helping the women's team, maybe. Okay. Another. Mm. Close to 2,700 players. So, yeah, they have... Good homework, typically. I think they have a lot of European champions actually on their on their coaching stuff. Wasn't Nair was a European champion? I think Potkin was a European champion. Motilev. Maybe it's a requirement. Yeah, I think Motilev <laughs> won at some point as well. Mm. So it's bad news for Maxim Matlakov, the current European champion. <laughs> Means he will be off the team and in the coaching squad very very soon. All right, let's continue looking at the games. Shukova versus Lachno on board number two. Having some bad blood there. Lachno, of course, used to represent the Ukraine, but now is playing for Russia. And this line here is something that I know a bit about. I've played these positions way more than I should, because I never know what to do after queen b6. I've myself have played knight to b3 and knight to b5, but Shukova finds a third square for the knight. She puts it on c2. Which makes a lot of sense if you're on time to go bishop g2 and well, put the knight on e3 one day if you need it. But the problem is supposed to be that black can go for a very quick opening of the position with d5. And if you were to take this pawn, say d, e, d, knight, d5, then black gains a tremendous lead in development. Takes, takes, bishop e6, rook d8 coming very quickly, bishop b4 check looming. So that's not a good idea. Therefore, after d5, you have to go bishop g2, sacrifice this pawn. And as far as I know, the time that you will have to spend trying to regain it, black can use to finish our development. Yeah, it's not supposed to be anything special for white. At least I've never been very attracted to this line from the white point of view. What's Shukova up to? She's thinking. Um, but so is Lachno. In general, it feels like in the women's section they get off a lot less from the board, get up a lot less from the board than in the open section. Do you have a theory for why that is? No. All right, <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Valentina Gunina is back in the team facing Anna Ushenina. From Ukraine, former world champion Anna Ushenina. Or mm -hmm. and then was she world champion? She won the FIDE knockout and then she lost to Huifan. Yeah, but that is, I mean, that is the same thing. The ones, I mean, the knockout right. and then you play a match. And she was absolutely crushed by by Huifan. I think on home turf, a match which was played in in Ukraine, if I'm not not mistaken. Yeah. Today playing against uh, Valentina Gunina. It was. What do you think is the match, uh, match strategy uh, coming into those matches? Is it just hold with black? Uh, or do you think they pay more attention to individual, maybe past histories? Or how do these things work? I don't think there's a fixed match strategy. It always sounds good to hold with black and play for a win with white. But it doesn't do much for you in practice. Like mm -hmm. you play a certain opponent and you need to prepare your openings. And um, of course, there's some decisions, but 
like play a more a sharper opening or a less sharp opening if you have two choices but most um, of these players have a fairly set opening repertoire which they will prepare and then play pretty much no matter what in a team championship so I don't think this strategy is like okay <clears throat> we made draws on three boards and then we really try to have Valentina Gruni now beat Oshini now or something like that I think it can change with with the match situation. It's quite a fluid thing. Of course, it's we will adjust the narrative to whatever happens. And I always like to ask the coaches, was this your strategy to make three draws and have Anish win, whatever. But I don't think it really works like that. Or at least in the team meetings I've been, there's never been a lot of talk about, okay guys, our strategy is you make a draw, you make a draw, you play for a win. There's a bit of an unwritten rule that with white you're supposed to play for a win in these, or well, sometimes it's a written rule in these team competitions. Because, yeah, if you make quick draws with white, then your teammates with the black piece, of course, won't be so happy. But that's about it. As for the position, I guess it's all theory. Knight f6, they also are experimenting with knight h6 here quite a bit. In order to after c3 castles d4 take and go d5 this is a line where black has had some success recently but Ushini now plays a more classical move knight to f6 e5 knight to d5 c4 knight to c7 and slightly strange looking line where white grabs a lot of space in the center black has the two bishops this was always considered to be better for white but after knight e6 queen h4 d6 I believe things are no longer considered to be so clear. I think Kasparov played this during his rare chess outing recently in the St. Louis Repton Blitz, I recall a game. Caruana versus Kasparov. And yeah, this is not so easy. After e d6, queen d6, knight c3. Could be this is the Kasparov game. Black went h5 in order not to allow castles bishop to h6. So yeah, looks like Theory battle here between Gunina and Ushenina. By the way, uh, once again, you know it by now, but one, uh, when I'm, especially when I'm here in the commentating chair, if you have any questions, any comments, uh, you can reach us by using Twitter, hashtag ETCC2017. And I see there's been a question from uh, Jupiker. Any chance Giri's interview from yesterday gets, uh, gets out somewhere? I guess that's a question for our producer, Sotiris. The videos will be uploaded. Keep an eye uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, <clears throat> there was a technical problem with that video. The audio was out of sync. Uh, as soon as we have time tonight, we will put it back in sync. And... Okay, so basically, uh, you probably heard it just there. Uh, problem with the audio, but the videos will all be up on our YouTube channel eventually. So uh, keep an eye on that. What's our YouTube channel? It's... It's called, uh, oh, where did I have it, European, European Team Chess Championship 2017. If you look for that on YouTube, you'll find us. And then, um, yeah, what were you saying? We were done with the Gunina game. Or I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> Shall we move on to board four? Inaga Penenko against Olga Giria. Sure. Um, what is this opening? Got a pan of attack. But after knight c6, white played the slightly rare move. C takes d5 here immediately. Typically, the main moves are knight to f3 when black decides between g6 and bishop to g4. Or bishop to g5, that's the more ambitious move. But instead, Gaponenko takes on d5, knight takes d5, and now knight to f3, inviting black to transpose to the line with bishop g4, which apparently Olga Gierja didn't feel like. And bishop f5 could also be moved in this move order. But Gierja spends the tempo on a6, stopping any shenanigans with bishop to b5. Oops. Or anything happening on that diagonal. Then yeah, we can do this, why not? Looks sensible. I'm not sure I'm sold on this early c takes d5. 
bishop d3, and now going for even more ambitious development, bishop g4, developing this bishop outside the pawn chain, b4 going e6, bishop e7. Looks sensible to me, I'm not sure. If this is also fruit of the famed Russian coaches' work overnight that they had to check, 6c takes d5, and Nayer at 4 a.m. came to the conclusion, you know what, we can go a6 and then go bishop g4. Someone wake up Olga and tell her the good news. No, I don't think that's how it works. But <laughs> but looking at the clock times, uh, maybe something like that did happen. I mean, Olga uh, hasn't spent any time, so definitely some surprise there. Uh, Gapelenko somewhere. Yeah, Black is already doing very well. So yeah, I'm I'm not sure. The C takes D5 line will catch on, and especially after A6, Bishop D3. You can put the bishop on D3 after black committed to e6, but here it feels like a very strange square for the bishop. I would think bishop c4 looks a lot more natural to me. I'm trying to provoke e6 or bishop e6, maybe but bishop e6 also yeah. feels a little clumsy. Then I don't know, bishop e3, whatever. Mm. Because of this bishop d3, you're not really putting any pressure on the black position, and here bishop g4 castles e6. Black is already quite comfortable. Not saying black is mm -hmm. winning or much better or anything, but I'd already take black here. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's easier to play. So yeah, opening is going well for Russia so far. Okay, so let's uh, check in with the top, uh, the board one match between um, Israel and Poland before we go back to the open. All right. Monika Sojko versus Julia Schweiger Sojko for Poland, Schweiger for Israel. Both married to chess grandmasters, is that accurate? Yes. Monika Sojko to Bartosz Sojko and Julia Schweiger to Akali Najdic. Actually, I haven't seen Bartosz uh, Sojko around for a while. Is that because he doesn't make the team anymore or does he play less chess? I feel I've seen him around a lot less than the past few years. I never go anywhere. He hasn't been. <clears throat> and I don't know. They have a bunch of kids, right? Don't they have three kids? It must be. Must so be hard for both of them to play in the same play. event. Maybe they take mm -hmm. turns. Yeah. But yeah, Sojko, He used to be rated around two six fifty. I think he his rating went down a bit. So maybe they haven't been putting him on the Polish team. But I have zero information on that situation. Not sure. Monika Sojko very much in the team, also holds the... Mm -hmm. I always struggle with the correct declaration, the male Grandmaster title, the men's Grandmaster title, the, the Grandmaster title, what, what, do you, what do you say? Yeah, I've been trying to stay as far away from all that debate. <laughs> no, I'm not starting to start a debate, I'm yeah, just wondering what Yeah, I would probably call say the, the, the male Grandmaster title, just to make it clear. But Yep. Anyway, Monika Sojko is a strong player, and here after bishop d6, she decides to allow knight to f4, parting with the two bishops, because she probably feels like white can use this time to clarify the situation to her advantage. I'm not quite sure how you do it, though. c4 maybe? Mm. Yeah, looks roughly equal to me, just castle away. And it also seems like Julia Schweiger has been blitzing out her moves, so maybe the opening did go. Or in Black's favor is strong, but Schweiger got her homework. Speaking of the Polish team, uh, in the chat, Jawbreaker is informing us that uh, Wojtaszek against Adams is your favorite Catalan, so that's something to keep in mind, something. Can look at if he's saying favorite Catalan, he means the chess opening. Right now, there's one has to be very careful. Declaring your favorite Catalans. And we'll have a look at it in a minute. But for now, first of all, Israel is no longer wearing their uniforms. What's the situation there? Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe they, you know, I think my theory on this is yesterday they got to board one, maybe not expecting to stay there. Or, I mean, this. It is somewhat random, this whole pairing thing. So I think you get to board one and you're like, oh, we're not sure we're going to be on board one ever again. So let's all wear our uniforms. 
And then they did. Uh, they didn't manage the whitewash, but they beat uh, Italy very convincingly, three and a half. So very deservedly still on top board. Also, Suat Atalik giving us some information about uh, Batos Sochko, saying he plays poker too, like Jan did for a while. I haven't touched any cards for ten years now. Like, <laughs> time flies when you're playing whatever. <laughs> and okay, so moving on uh, to board. Two, uh, where Marcel Efremsky is playing against Yolanta Zawadzka. Yeah, Zawadzka for Poland. This looks like an exchange. Rui Lopez, is that what we call it? Yeah, takes, takes. Hmm, F6, D4, takes, and Queen takes D4. That's not the main move in this position. Or is it? No, you're supposed to go knight takes d4 here. It's a little more critical. After queen d4, plex. Play is reasonably simple, but the general conflict remains the same. Black is the two bishops would like to open the position for them by either some f5 at some point or just putting pieces on good squares. Well, white has the poor majority on the king side, this 4 versus 3, would like to exchange. The dark square bishop, or in general, any piece exchange tends to be in white's favor. Dumb the position down and then make something happen on the king side later on. Roughly equal, of course, but here, yeah, the c4 followed by bishop e3. I don't find very convincing, so I would already take black here if you play whatever c5, knight anywhere. Also, e6. Just because I saw Marcel just sat down at the board there, my theory about that they are wearing their uniforms, but their overalls, uh, not well, jackets. So I didn't spot them at first, but very much still out there. Huh. Yeah. If bringing your uniform can be counted as wearing it, or yeah, maybe it's I mean, Mar Marcel is wearing it. That's right true. Right there. So maybe on board one they're wearing it as well. Can't yeah. really tell from here. So, yeah. Not a lot of uniformity in wearing the uniforms. Suat is saying knight e5, bishop g2 looks dangerous. Which, Which game, game is Suat talking about? the one we just came from. I Which guess. game did we just come from? What are they talking about? Oh, maybe that's a... I don't know. I oh, know they're talking about Shukova Lakno. Uh -huh. I was a bit... So if we just very quickly go back to that, maybe to follow the, the conversation in the chat, because someone was um, wondering if the, night, the mo night move you were talking about, knight c2, was wondering if that was a mistake. And Suat is saying that in that game, c4 uh, was the new move. Uh, that knight c2 is a modern move, and d5 the best, uh, best answer. I'm not following it all. All of this is normal, but... <coughs> Yeah, knight c2, d5, bishop g2, dc is considered to be an equalizer. Is that what he's saying? Or like, I can't follow. Mm. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Equal position. White can win the pawn back. Knight e3, knight e5, takes, takes. Queen a4, check. Bishop d7, takes, castles. But you're not supposed to be better here with white. Black will just go rook c8, rook d8, bishop c6. Egalite. So what he's saying is knight e5, knight e3, knight c4. Yeah, that's what I said that's as what well. Just mm. Okay, yeah. Okay. So anyway, let's leave these uh, Jokova, let's leave La Jokova and Lagner to it. Go back to where we came from, which was uh, Efremsky and Zabatska, which I yeah, think just finished looking at. So let's move on to board three where uh, Karina Sherkovska is playing against uh, Masha Klenova. Mm -hmm. Yeah. White has more bishops. I prefer White's position here. That's all I got. What can you tell us about Karina Sherkovska? Is that how you pronounce it as well? I'm not sure. What I can tell you is uh, it was her birthday a couple, of, uh, a couple of days ago. She posted some photos. Congratulations. Some photos on uh, Instagram. Uh, I think her team prepared a nice surprise for her. Got some cake, 
So how do you feel about having a birthday on a, during a chess tournament? I feel it's a great accomplishment that we were all born and it should be celebrated. <laughs> um, and especially during a chess tournament. It's a great occasion to bond with your teammates and have a cake. And I don't know, remember how nice it is. <laughs> that we are all here. So, Karina, you're a bishop pair, you like her position, that's yes, all? Yes, yes. Okay. Probably, I also read somewhere that the two weeks after your birthday, you have special energy. And therefore, maybe she's channeling that energy into putting pressure on Masha Klinova's position here. Masha Klinova, of course. Um, we talked about her earlier, the longtime girlfriend of Mikhail Gurovic, who I've also seen around. I'm not sure if he's coaching somebody. He used to coach the Turkish team at some point. Is that still a thing? I'm he's sure. holding a trainer's seminar. Uh, oh! Downstairs. Can I join? Because I heard he's I should become Fide's senior trainer because it will make me more employable for all kinds of jobs. Can you do that here? Yes, you can do it, but it's uh, in the mornings. Oof! Oof! No. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyway, yeah, why is slightly better here, I would guess. And then on board for uh, the young player from Israel, Michel uh, Lahav, against Claudia Coulon. Do you have any information on those two players? Any recent birthdays? Zero. I've got nothing. Me neither. It's because we don't prepare for these shows. Don't we? I think Claudia Coulon might be studying in the UK. I've been seeing her play in the English league there. It's not usually a league where you get flown into from too far away. So that's, that's all I've got. Not very useful. <laughs> Heathrow is a pain, like if you can avoid it by any chance. <clears throat> I've had to change flights there a couple of times, but you have to make it through like four lines and they che check your passport four different times. It's really also, four or five different good. terminals, you might have to change terminals. Yeah, don't. And then they ask you a question about your luggage. And I do think I speak English reasonably well, but often I can't understand a word they're saying to me because the problem with British people is they think they are the only ones who know how to speak English, which is probably true because it's their native English. But they don't adjust to us Patsers foreign as English so that we can understand each other. Like yesterday I joined the British table with Peter Wells and Malcolm Payne and Jonathan Spearman. They were analyzing some rook end game. And if that wasn't bad enough, like they were talking about complicated stuff, making jokes and I was thinking, I'm doing live commentary in English every day and I can't understand the words you, pe you people are saying. Something's very off here. Maybe you should start playing in the, in the France, yeah, get some practice in. Or I should start, with, with your hero. that sounds a bit extreme, because you just said they don't fly people in there. <laughs> um, you could hang out with your, your idol, Danny Gormelli. I wouldn't call him my idol, but yeah, I've been fascinated by the Danny Gormelli podcast on Ben Johnson's... No, he, he was an interview on Ben Johnson's podcast, Perpetual Chess Podcast. And yeah, I learned a lot about the British chess scene from him for sure. By the way, Jan, uh, speaking of birthdays, uh, Frami SC in the chat is informing us that it's today Vtashnik's uh, birthday. Oh, congratulations! Happy 70th birthday to Lubomir Vtashnik. He's an inspiration to all of us. Like, st still looks like 40. It is, yeah, inspiring that he still bought one for Slovakia, doing well. Almost defeated Jan Krzysztof Duda in the first round. That's, yeah, great. Let's go to his game. Sua is also a long, long term, long yeah. time friend. With he was saying that you should curious. tell us more, more about him mm -hmm. in the chat. Uh, so who is he playing today? I have no idea. Is he playing today? I don't like playing on my birthday. He is playing today. I saw him, but I can't recall. Uh, he's playing against uh, Ioannis Nikolaidis. Oh, that's East. another man I called very old. So that's <laughs> 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 I'm not making any friends here. But well, we're cool with Nicolaitis, we spoke about it. Mm, but how can I find that game? I can of course search for it, but that makes stuff, normally makes stuff awkward. Here we are. Oh yeah, this line, I know this line. You can make all these moves and feel very smart about it. You play rook a2, rook d2, then queen b1, queen a2. Then you go h4, king h2, get the other rook out of the way, play queen h1. You can move back and forth for many times, many moves. Ulf Anderson used to play like this with white. 
he was enjoying it greatly because the white position is pretty much unbreakable. And if black does something stupid, white can sometimes be a little better. However, Dr. Flachnik is a very experienced hedgehog player and he probably will know. Suat is saying that this. you should tell us how you gathered uh, him and Flachnik to analyze in your kitchen. That's a long time ago, yeah, I'm not sure what went wrong there. <laughs> but yeah, I recall some, some Grunfeld analysis. I'm not sure it was very useful. I was, yeah, the old days. So G3 Grunfeld? I can't remember. Mm. What year was that? 2002? Long time ago. Another lifetime. I was wondering, let's go, because people were asking us earlier, um, they were mentioning this game between Wojtaszek and Adams. I'm not sure I get the colors right. So let's quickly check in with that. Also, Nigel was tweeting about playing against Duda. Duda, who so far is on one and a half out of two, but from two completely lost positions. So let's just uh, run through that entire match quickly. Speaking of Nigel's tweets, I was more interested he tweeted that Luke van Veli <laughs> apologized to him. But Nigel <laughs> tweeted it out, not Luke. So uh, I'm... Do you have any information on that? It doesn't sound like <laughs> yes, Luke Yes, I heard, I heard Luke. Yeah, well, <laughs> Luke told me about this tweet and I don't think he quite apologized. But Yeah, I, would, uh, I was surprised Ivan, to read Ivan that. Ivan also had a very strong opinion <laughs> on the matter, which I don't think I can quite um, repeat here. But There was some controversy, I recall, that... Nigel played a match against Hu Yifan in Hochevein and he already won the match. Then he lost the last game and he was claiming that there's some feeder rule. That, that the game cannot be rated if the match has already been decided. Right. And this since, was correct. No, the rule exists and we know that Nigel has always been in favor of all the feeder rules. So, of course, he insisted on that one. And there was some controversy with I think Luke felt, yeah, that the game should be rated, or I can't quite remember, but there was quite some back and forth, and I was surprised that Nigel tweeted. Um, also, none of them is really Luke the kind of, none of them is the kind of guy to back down. Not really. From no. uh, an argument, so yeah. Maybe we can get Nigel in here one day, and he will tell us all about it. I'm Maybe Nigel intrigued. and Luke at the same time Maybe. to settle yeah. it once and for all. It seems like it's settled, Luke. <laughs> Realized he was wrong, rules are rules, and he apologized. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, let's get to the match. Michael Adams <coughs> with Black against Radek Wojtaszek. Both these guys are my teammates in the Baden-Baden team. And they are playing the good old Catalan. DC4, Queen C2, A6. Subject of my video series, which is old now, but still, of course, very, very relevant. A4, Bishop D7, Queen C4, Bishop C6, Bishop F4. Bishop d6, I believe I gave this as well in my series. Move to queen c1. What would I give? a5? I think I gave a5. Nice. But knight b7 is also a legal move. Knight c3, queen e7, a5. All of this, I've praised Radek for his homework in the past. I'm pretty sure still home preparation by Wojtaszek, who is one of the scariest theoreticians out there. But Mickey Adams is solid. So h6 played, rook to e1, preparing e4, and telling black, now you should do something before I get an e4. Mickey does, he takes an f3 and plays, takes an f4 as well, plays c6. Now black is ready to simplify the position with e5, should you feel the need, but then white would have a little to work with because of his pawn on a5, fixing the black queen side. So yeah, not much for white. But maybe a little something. And Mickey decides it's not yet time to clarify the situation with e5. Probably just wants to sit behind this very solid structure. And tell White, do your worst. I am not intending to open the position for you. By all means, feel free to try to attack me. Okay, so let's move on and check in with uh, Nigel Short, who we're just talking about playing against Young. Uh, Jan Krisch uh, of Duda. Nigel with white. And what what opening is this? This looks interesting. D4, knight 6 C4, C6. So Jan Krisch just pretended not to play the Slav. 
But then after Nigel went to c4, maybe he thought Nigel would play one of these British openings, like bishop f4 or bishop g5. He was trying to provoke that, but after c4 he went back to solid. Went for the Slav. After e3, most people play bishop to f5 or bishop to g4 or a6. e6, of course, is also a very playable move in tank to transpose the semi-Slav. But white doesn't have to go with knight c3 here, after which we would get the same as left to knight bd7. Instead, he tries to use the move order play by black with the move b3. That is considered to be the critical test. Black goes c5 here. I've seen people do this. It was always, always felt strange to me that you can just lose a tempo that early with c6 to c5. I've never been a fan of this line for black. But, you know, Christoph will know what he's doing here c5, bishop to b2, c takes d4, e takes d4, bishop, ah no, d takes c4. He's trying to inflict white with hanging pawns. That's what we call hanging pawns, pawns of c4 and d4. They don't have neighbors anymore, can't be defended. ASAP. Are you a fan of hanging pawns? No, but I still prefer them to isolate. I, I cannot deal with isolated pawns, like I end up losing them. Let's say eighty percent of my games. So. Well, I thought you liked the hanging pawns because normally they lead to attacking chances. You try to, you know, to my use battery, the center to yeah. build your battery and to attack on the king side. Queen a five check, young Christoph playing very directly. My guess is I don't know what the idea is. After knight c three, it's probably bishop to a three, undermining this construction. But after knight b d two, I'm not sure if this is home preparation. It looks. All of this play looks a little shady to me, to be honest with you. This C5 I'm not a fan of, C, D, E, D, and then D, C4 here as well. Maybe it's all homework, maybe it's good, but it looks interesting. Knight C6. By interesting, do you mean not so great? Or? It looks dubious to me. <clears throat> Never mind. Well, yeah, Queen B4 might just be a lack of understanding. Uh, in general, I have great faith in this young man. Duda, very interesting player, very sharp player. E queen b4. I guess knight is going to take and castle and claim to be slightly better. Maybe. Even though I just said with hanging pawns you're supposed to attack. Here the white lead in development should play a bit of a role. I guess maybe we can go for some quick c5, knight c4. I don't really know. It looks suspect how Duda has been playing. Could be that just works move by move. Nothing to criticize. Okay, and then on board three we have a Kaspar pure one against David Howell. We do have that. Mm. Let me just find the whole match. Problem chess. You know, sorry to interrupt you, Jan, but I was saying sorry. when I realized we were coming to David's game, I was thinking, okay, I'm looking, I'm curious to, to see what the clock situation is going to be. And just, <laughs> I mean, never have I ever, I don't think, seen David not be. It's not just that he's lower on time than his opponent, but he he has. Half, I didn't even know the games had been going for so long. He has half of his opponent's time, mm -hmm. which after an hour is quite the accomplishment. That's pretty much what we see every day, right? He yeah. has 44, 5 minutes, so probably is 1.30. But looks like he's using his time. He's not walking around. He looks very focused. Studying the position in great depth. Yeah, he said yesterday it was his dream not to end up being in time trouble. That doesn't seem like he wants to like move faster to accomplish that trick. Mm. Anyway, the position, I don't know what's going on. It looks like it's fine. Knight g7, knight e6, or knight g7, knight f5. Doesn't really feel like Pjorun has gotten anywhere with this rookie one Berlin, which is not supposed to give you much in the first place. It also seems like David did his homework here. Queen c3 is a funky looking move. I've seen this position, like people go c3 or bishop d3 or even knight c3, I believe Luke McShane, is this the line? I played something like this maybe at some point. Queen c3 looks weird. I don't know, maybe this is all 
Here on his homework, apparently, he still has 130, so he's blitzed out all his moves. But if Queen C3 and B4 is the way to fight against the Berlin, then I don't know. Might as well play the Jocko Piano. Mateusz Bartel, he is studying the position just as deeply as David Howell, if not deeper, on board number three. Playing against Gawain Jones. What can you tell us about Gawain Jones? Gawain Jones, he's had a, a very good year. He won the Vikanze B group. He also won the British Championship. Um, he's, go he's going to be playing uh, in the A group. Well, thanks to winning the B group, he will be playing in the A group in Vikanze uh, this coming January, which I think will be his first appearance on that level. Um, he's a very interesting player. Uh, very dynamic style and aggressive style and he's, he's written a very good well I say a very good I heard it was a very good book I haven't read it uh, but he's written a two volume book on the dragon and yeah I think uh, he's been making a lot of progress recently How old is he? He must be old now uh, he's been around for a while I think he's turning 30, sure. I think he's a year older than me. Born in 87 or 88? Still young. Around forever, still young. Both these guys. Howell, Howell is even younger than Gawain? Howell is uh, from the famous 1990 generation, like Magnus, like Karyakin, like so many others. Those are millennials, right? 1990 already makes a millennial. Where's the cutoff for being a millennial? Like which, which year? Because I'm not a millennial, I've checked. I'm Generation X. But I've always been curious if, yeah, which year you have to be born to be a millennial. Do you consider yourself a millennial? No, but then I have to say I never gave this any thought until just now. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> I give it a lot of thought. I read somewhere that it's 1983, but that feels wrong because then 34-year-olds would still be millennials nowadays, so. Um, I think it's more like 88, but please let us know. I'm very curious about this. It's very important. Um, all right, so England playing Poland. Someone's going to win. You didn't say anything about this position, or did we? No. Gawain, I don't like this position one bit. Looks like black has all his pieces. Um, the right squares, of course. He does have these two weakish pawns, but it feels... Like, it's going to be very hard to exploit those because the white pawn on e5 also is a little overextended. If you can't build an attack behind this pawn like with some g3, h4, then no, it's too far advanced. And here, with this bishop on c6, I don't think an attack is realistic. Apart from that, black already has the option. I'm not sure. I don't think I'd do it, but it looks like it's possible to just take here. Not winning a pawn, queen h5 doesn't work because of knight d3, but bishop h7 is a typical tactic that I've blundered many times. Anyway, white would not be better here at all. Takes and rook fd8. But I have a feeling that black already is more comfortable, so you should probably avoid this and do something else. So, no, I don't like white's position here. Okay, so we'll come back to this one. And today we had the, we were talking about the captain switch. Uh, today they did. Uh, swap and we see P12s there standing behind the players. Um, so Malcolm taking a rest day. No, I think it's because we called Malcolm out yesterday for posing as the captain when it's been Peter Wells all along. So yeah, I'm glad that Malcolm has been ejected from the playing hall for pretending to be an official. Um, we had a request in the chat earlier on to go to Papa Ioannou's game. He's playing against uh, Lupulescu. All right. Who's Greece playing? Romania? Probably since he's playing Lupulescu. They lost yesterday, but seemed in good spirits. At least Banikas told us. Well, it's not so important if we lose. We just try to our, do our best, have fun. I'm not sure I'm buying that, because if it's not so important that they lose, they don't lose a lot of matches. <laughs> um, but, he also yeah. mentioned uh, the fantastic team spirit after the interview with you in the studio. I also interviewed him. I, I think he said they've been playing with the same team for 20 years now, so these guys really know each other well. 
and um, I hope to see them have a, a great result here. Happy to be playing at home. No, they must have one new guy, right? This Pavlidis, is, is that his name? He, he kind of been part of the team for 20 years. Yeah, he was right? probably just born. It's his first time, actually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, they kicked him out today. Today it's all the veterans. Today it's Papa Iwano, Banikas, Dimitrios, Mastro Vasilis, and still is Halkias on board number four. And yeah, these guys, maybe not 20 years, but 15 years they, they've been on the team for sure. 19 years and some... Mastro Vasilis is also 19 years? Okay. Uh, <coughs> Mastro Vasilis may be slightly less, but the others they were already playing since 96 or 98. Yeah, yeah. but Mastro Vasilis... Because I know we had a match Germany against Greece, I believe, in 2002. And Mastro Vasilis was playing, but I felt like this was his debut and he was still in Wimbledon. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Long story short, we are all very, very old. And uh, Jan, I don't know if you were aware of this, but uh, you were joking about Lubo of Tashnik turning 70, but he actually has a round birthday, it's his 60th. I wasn't joking. Mm. Um, yeah, congratulations, Dr. Tashnik. So, what's happening? And we gotta give him as much as I like to make fun of him. He looks younger than 60, doesn't he? He looks in good shape. Seriously, yeah. I think he eats healthy and goes running and all. Um, <laughs> all this nonsense. Reads books to keep his mind engaged and like all the good stuff. And um, Papa's in trouble. What has he done? What have you done to your rook, Papa Iwano? This is very out of character. Is that rook just not getting out? I don't know. Weird opening stuff already. I think he freaked because. He's not normally the type to really sacrifice pawns, but here for some reason he played knight bd2 and Lupulescu grabbed the pawn. I'm sure probably not thought the main line is castle. It's followed by b6, that's what's going to happen. But after dc4, I think he got nervous and wanted to win his pawn back ASAP. And here e3 already looks a little ugh. weakening the light squares. e3, bishop b5, b3, trying to once again get this pawn back ASAP, but queen d5. Takes, takes, takes. It's still a pawn down. And in order to win the pawn back, he has to put his rook into the line of fire. Now, this is a bit of an opening disaster. And yeah, I'm surprised because it's out of character for Papayano to even give that pawn. Why not play bishop d2? Get a solid position. So let's have a look. Rook c1, queen a6, rook c7, knight c6. The problem is, knight d5 is a threat. Just picking up the rook. Queen b3, rook b8. You have to go to some extreme length to keep the rook alive. You can't castle. First of all, because it's not legal. Secondly, even if it was legal after knight d5, you'd be in trouble. So I don't know what you can do. Knight e5 is what the computer says, but ugh, horrible as well. Castles. No, pop and trouble here. With the white pieces, which yeah, is very much out of character. Banikas on board number two. He's not in trouble, some weird headshot structure. Must be feeling good after defeating Movsesian yesterday. Dimitrios Mastro Vasilis, whose brother is also Grandmaster playing on Greece too. And what's going on here? Why does the two bishops, which is nice? He might lose a pawn, which is not as nice. Probably compensation with this guy here. I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. You have to probably move this bishop somewhere, but the problem is it doesn't have any good square to defend the bishop on d6. Bishop e2. Or I guess compensation for the pawn, but no more than that. Dimitrios Mastro Vasilis. Nevednishi Halkias. Whoa, sharp. Queen d3. Queen g3. I 
I don't understand this position. Are you a, a Sicilian player? What do you do after one e4? Uh, e5 mostly. Me too. Solid. <laughs> yeah, it feels safer not to, to let that pawn advance any further. What, what's that layout on the screen? 2017 minus Greece? <laughs> I'm just curious. Mm. No, no, go ahead. I didn't mean, no, 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 it was nice. <laughs> um, I really, once we're done with that, well, let's have a look at this job position and then I really want to check back in with Liko against uh, Anish Giri. Let's do it, I don't care about this position. <laughs> Because uh, Anish has only just started thinking now uh, on move 21. Big theoretician, Mr. Giri. But so is Leiko. Oh, but Leiko spent an hour? Ooh, he's out prepared. This is like the T800 facing the T1000. Uh, and there we see the Hungarian captain. He used to be, I think it's the first time he's a captain. He used to always play on the team, uh, Shaba Balov. Actually, last, last European team championship, uh, Judit Polga was the captain for the Hungarian men's team. Yeah, it's interesting. I decided to go with Erdos and bring Balog as a captain because he's normally another candidate for the Erdos job to play mm -hmm. on a high board, play very solidly, Shabba Balog. But he seems to take his new role very seriously, sitting there, fully focused. All right, so Anish blitzed out a thousand moves of preparation here. Mm -hmm. G5, knight h5. I've seen all this stuff. White sacrifices a pawn, but gains, con gains the two bishops, gets, gains control over the light squares and tries to play c4 or to win this pawn back. ASAP. That looks like Mr. Giri he has seen this position before as well. Takes, takes. h4, played by Leiko, who apparently has been taking time. That's more surprising than Anish blitzing it out, because normally Leiko, yeah. Also knows he thinks very, very deeply. And I wouldn't be surprised if Leiko was just trying to remember or to decide which line to play, and is still in his little book as well. Anyway, why couldn't you take the pawn? I like taking pawns, but this one is probably poisoned due to rook c5, followed by queen b5. And if queen takes, that nah, just feels wrong. The queen goes out of the way. I mean, this game is not, I think it's really, you know, when the pairings came out and people were like, oh, Leiko against Giri, joke, joke, whatever. Um, but this very much feels like one of both kings could get uh, mated here. I don't think so. No? I think it's going to end peacefully and all the Leiko against Giri people will have their field day. But no, they're both big theoreticians, that's why I said. And she's done his homework here. But, the, yeah, it's going to be hard to checkmate the black king. And white, normally, even if he's out of book first, tends to be quite solid here. He, even being a pawn down after h4. He wants to go bishop d3, threaten some queen e4 business. So Giri has to find a way to create a play here. Rook c5, queen e4, rook a8 is brought to you by the computer attacking. By the way, and people in the chat are telling us that Papa Ioannou has just sacrificed, apparently his take on an F7. We will not go back there uh, immediately because we've just come from it, but we'll make sure to check in later on. But then, to be fair, that rook was maybe lost anyway, but I didn't expect a sacrifice. Oh. No, it's desperation. We can have a look, but yeah, I don't think. Let's quickly run through the other boards uh, of this board one match uh, between... Hungary and the Netherlands. Okay. Let me hear this. Eh. this might be a good position to have against Erwin Lamy because he's a very solid player. And here in this position, you're once again obliged to make something happen. It's a bit similar to this Gawain Jones position where there's a pawn on e5 versus a powerful bishop on this diagonal. I would guess that Erdos can be quite happy because I, normally it's not in Erwin's DNA to play queen h5, bishop h6, knight g5, or knight h2, knight g4, go for checkmate, and I also feel like with this very strong bishop it will be hard to accomplish. 
Having said all that, I don't think White is in trouble or anything, but yeah, I like Black's position. Benji Bork got this surprisingly quiet endgame against Richard Rapport after D6. Yeah. He took back with the D4. Rapport, maybe, yeah, he's trying to broaden his horizons, even though I think he's always been a good endgame player, but here, yeah, he's, it seems like he consciously went for endgames. First opportunity. I think in this match, we were talking about match strategies earlier. I think today it's very clear um, Benji Bok will have had the directive to hold. I th think uh, Richard Report is one of them. And um, don't you agree? Would you not agree that? Yeah, of course, but he's almost a hundred points low rated with the black pieces. Like, of course, a draw would be a good result for the Netherlands. I'm just saying. Normally, to give that directive, yeah, please make a draw against a player hundred <laughs> points low, higher rated with black, won't help anybody. So it's more about the general, like, what does Rapport like to do, what doesn't he like to do, and so on. Also, oh, yeah. Suat is saying that he thinks that Lamy may be much better. Much better, really. I don't think so. How do you want to be much better with white here? Hmm. Queen h5, knight g5, I don't think attacks work. Let's play where I want c8. Uh, I'd be surprised. I thought black can just put his pieces wherever. And I didn't see how white can make progress, but maybe I'm underestimating some, some sacrifices here. Interesting. Okay, and then finally on board four, uh, Jordan van Verreest against Sultan al Mashi. <clears throat> yeah, al Mashi took a pawn, but Jordan, being the firebrand that he is, I'm sure doesn't mind this position spicing up considerably. a5, as I said, bishop d2 is what they do here, bishop a6, b3, queen e6, queen e4. All still reasonably theoretical castles. Bishop e2, rook e8, takes queen e5, and queen c2. Typical Scottish middle game where yeah. Black is now a pawn up, but he has to deal with his weirdly placed pieces on a6 and b6, while white is trying to somehow build an initiative. Now that he gave this pawn, I would guess that Jordan was a very Interesting attacking player. He's quite happy here. And Almashi, nah, it's hard to read. Almashi is always very stoic. But he's taking time, so I have a feeling something could have gone a little wrong there in Almashi's preparation. There was a request in the chat earlier uh, from Jawbreaker to look at the match. They're actually playing right besides these guys, so we can see them in the background. Um, it's your Spanish friends who are playing against second seed uh, Azerbaijan. Let's do it. Nino Anton against Mamed Yarov on the top board. Where are they? Ah, here they are. Weird position. Whoever gets an eye to d4 or d5 work first, normally better here. It feels like it's tough for either side to really get there. White would like to go knight f5, knight e3, but the e4 pawn is always hanging, and I guess you dream of maneuvers like knight d2, knight f1, f3, knight e3, knight e5, but it takes forever. While black probably is also thinking about going knight to b8, followed by knight to c6, when white probably has to take it. Um, Strange position. Start with this. this. Let's call it equal so we don't have to think okay. any further. Mm -hmm. Then on board two, Rajabov against Salgado. Salgado, super solid place. One of my favorite openings, the Vienna. Daring Rajabov to go for, in my opinion, the critical move, bishop c4, knight e4, short castles. But Rajabov isn't having any of it. Plays bishop g5. 
and Salgado does not play the move c5, which I recommend in all my repertoire series, but instead goes for h6, which we've seen, who played this recently? Uh, Levon played this against Ding Liren in the World Cup final. Bishop c4, castles, castles, c5, e5, queen d8, queen e2, c takes d, and rook a d1. I think all of this has been seen before. Takes, takes, bishop d7. Black gives the pawn back in order to put his bishop on the long diagonal. C D bishop c6. And Rajabov does not want to end up slightly worse positionally after some knight b6 controlling d5 square. So he sees the opportunity here to play d4, d5, simplify the position a little. When I guess only white can be somewhat better, but it feels feels fairly equal. It feels like black should hold this without particular trouble. So yeah, Salgado being his solid safe, solid self on board number two. Board number three, Korneyev versus Naidic. Korneyev has been playing for Spain for a long time. I believe he used to live in Spain, but no longer does. Do you know anything about, about him or that? No. Me neither. I do know that I first played Korneyev, I believe more than 20 years ago. But Wilhelmshofen Open, he was big killer in the open scene in the late 90s and probably in the 2000s as well but then he changed his hunting grounds to Spain still a very strong player rated, I don't know what he's rated, 2570 somewhere in that neighborhood here on the Spanish national team versus Akari Nijic who lost the first game then came back in the second game, won the second and here the position is probably around equal why well, should be careful to keep the entry square on C2 under control well, as long as he can do that. It's going to be hard for black to do anything constructively there. Egalite. So it seems like Spain are doing solidly so far. Uh, Azerbaijan really, I think, today is a must-win match for them. They lost the first round against Italy. And they can't afford to drop any more points so early in the tournament if they want to stay in contention for the title and the medal places. Yeah, it's probably good for them to win. Um, Rauf Mamedov against Ibarra is a bit of a theory debate in the Jacopiano on the fourth board. It looks like Ibarra is playing a line that this has long been considered good for black, so I'm a little surprised that Mamedov goes here. But sometimes Mamedov likes to freestyle in the opening because his b4 bishop e7 has not been considered to be it danger forever. Big point is after b5, knight a5, knight takes e5, black is too fast with bishop f6. And if you can't do that, then yeah, you just showed your hand a little too quickly. a6, rook to e1, bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, rook a2, some deep maneuvers, f6, rook d2 by Ralph Mamedov. Very creative player, wants to go d4 here. But I'm still not sure. After king h8, which looks obvious to get out of this diagonal. I take black. Feels like the opening has gone wrong for Mameda. Okay, so I think we're now one and a half hour into this uh, round three. Maybe time for our first little break um, of the day. Uh, we will be back with you in about 10 minutes with all the action here from the Crater Maris Resort. <laughs> 